Good morning and welcome back. My name is Tom with Inflow Communications and this is part two of our Shortel Connect admin training. Um, if you are continuing from Tuesday, you know that we left off at the user groups in the class of service. If you are joining us today for the first time in this series, that is where we will beginning, be beginning and we will be going through the user groups and class of service as well as work groups, hunt groups and auto attendance today to finish up the admin training. Um, as I noted, my name is Tom Lyons. I'm a senior engineer with Inflow Communications. Also joining us today to answer some questions in the background is Chris Sheehan. He is our project success manager and trainer here. And a little bit about Inflow Communications before we get started here. Um, Inflow has a sole focus on unified communications and contact center solutions. Phone systems is what we do. We bring a wealth of knowledge to that environment so we can support you um, in the best ways possible. We are a platinum partner with Shortel, meaning that we are in the upper echelons of support and sales for Shortel on a yearly basis. We have 25 dedicated engineers, project managers, and support techs, which makes us um, the biggest fleet of engineers in the business today. Um, so you will be able to get somebody with a wealth of knowledge um, that will be able to help you with anything you need. We currently support over 150,000 endpoints and 600 customers nationwide. And we have offices and employees in California, Idaho, Iowa, Nebraska, Oregon, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Washington, and Wisconsin. And here's a few logos of the some of the companies that we support. And as I noted, over 150,000 endpoints supported, and it's actually globally across 700 customers at this point. We actually have some customers overseas as well. And a couple quick support plan updates on the inflow side um, so that you are aware. Um, starting in 2018, um, if you are on the gold platform, which is going to be the majority of our inflow customers here, um, you do get your inflow analytics bundle, which is powered by, by, by Bright Metrics, um, which is pre built core system reports and dashboard templates. Um, you get two for the main director side, which is the PBX side. And then also if you have the enterprise contact center environment, you get two there as well. Also as a part of that tool, you get three real-time dashboards included um, as part of your gold package. What this does is it will allow you to watch your work groups or contact center groups in real time, see how many calls are coming in, your agent statuses, um, any queued calls and just see basically the lifeblood of the system and how things are going for you. And then you also get access to our new VX Suite remote access tool, which will allow us to get into the system at a moment's notice whenever you need help so that we can start working on problems immediately. Also, as one of the changes for 2018 is the Gold Advantage Plan. Um, this is kind of a tier in between our gold and platinum support. Um, in addition to everything that Gold gets, Gold Advantage customers will get advanced network monitoring and diagnostics using the VX Pulse tool that I talked about previously. Um, does include traps and other options that will allow you to see your network and other facets of your environment easy, much more easily. Advanced call recording, which is a, a cloud-based call recording service. So if you need call recording, that is included as part of the Gold Advantage plan as well. Custom Music on Hold, which is an extension of our partnership with Woodstock Media, who provides prompting for us. Um, they can create a custom Music on Hold option for you as well. A cloud disaster recovery auto attendant that is basically designed to take any calls that your system cannot in the event of an outage, providing a stopgap so that we can get your system up and running while you are still able to do business. And then also, a contact center success management program, which is an annual on-site two-day operational assessment and recommendations report on your contact center system. And if you are platinum, all of the changes included above are rolled into platinum as well. So you get all of these features as a part of your platinum agreement. And then last but not least, a couple quick 14.2 updates um, on the Mitel side here. Um, for those of you that are on Shortel version 14.2, ECC 9 and Mobility 8, which are the latest versions of that of those particular platforms, um, they are supported by Mitel until December 31st, 2019, at which point they will be at end of support. Any full width 
uh, shore gear switches, which are the 40 slash 8s, the 60 slash 12s, the 120 slash 24s, and the T1s, are end of MyTel support after June 30th, 2018. Hats with shore gear switches, so the 30s, the 50s, the 90s, the, the V versions of the 50 and 90, the G20 T1 and T1A, the T1K, the E1K, and the 220 E1, and the SG24A are end of sale as of June 30th, 2018. But any purchase between now and then will be supported by Mitel for at least five years from the end of sale date. Um, kind of going in line with that, the VPN concentrator is also end of Mitel support as of June 30th. And Mitel is working on a quarter two promotion to move customers to new uh, ST switches or virtual switches. The ST switches are Connect specific. So you would have to get updated to Connect or be on Connect in order to use those. Um, the virtual switches can be used by anybody on 14 as long as they have VMware in their environment. So you do have some options there as well. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch my screen here. So stand by. All right. And so on my screen here is the Connect Director platform. And we are going to pick up where we left off yesterday. And where we left off yesterday was user groups. Um, so if you recall, what I had gone over in the call about user groups um, just briefly is that it's essentially a container for your users. So if, you, if you're used to using Active Directory, you can think of the user group as the container that you keep your users in, and that's where you assign the permissions for those users. So it's a way to um, have granular control over what users can do what in the system. And so what you see on your screen here is you see um, a bunch of different user groups. And then next to it on the top pane, you will see three different COSs or classes of service. Um, those are actually what govern the different features that are available. And so I'm going to go through these real quick. There's a number of options. And what I would recommend is if you have any specific questions about um, one or two check boxes in what I'm about to show you, um, go ahead and throw them in the questions box and we'll get those answered at the end. But I'm going to show you guys what is available in these, just so you know they're aware that you're aware of where to go to actually make those changes. And then we're going to jump into hunt groups and work groups, which is where you're going to spend a lot more of your time as an administrator of the system. So looking at the um, user groups here, I'm going to go ahead and click on the executives user group, which is one of the, the built-in user groups here. And you'll see that um, on the bottom pane here, which I will expand, you do have your three classes of service that the user group calls. Um, as you can see here, I'm using a class of service called fully featured for telephony, no restrictions for call permissions, which is essentially where you can call if you're in that user group, like if you can only call local or if you're allowed to call long distance or international. And it's using the large mailbox option for voicemail. Um, next to these, there's a whole bunch of different links that says view class of service. Clicking on those will actually bring you to that class of service. Under those are a couple of options for 911. You'll see two little check boxes here. Send caller ID as caller's emergency identification or send DID as caller's emergency identification. What these boxes will do is by default, um, they will both be checked. And if the, they are checked and a, a user calls 911, instead of using the trunk number, what the system is going to try to do is send the DID or the caller ID of the user as the emergency service identification number. Depending on how you do 911, this is important. Um, in the majority of cases, um, you're going to want to send that main line number because that is what the, um, the police department is going to have on file with an address and you may need to uncheck these boxes. If you use analog lines for 911 though, which is very common, um, these won't actually do anything because analog lines will always send out the number that's associated with the line. Under that, you have an account code collection mode. If you're using account codes to keep track of who's calling what in the system, you can turn this on to force a specific user group to use those account codes. Um, there are two options. Optional, you can put in an account code, but 
if you don't, the call still works or required, meaning you have to know an account code to dial specific numbers or those calls will not go through. And to go along with that, if your users are on the Connect client, um, the system can actually show them a list of account codes when they dial so they can just click the appropriate account code and send it through that way. Under that, there's a voicemail interface mode. We're not going to get into that today, but that is for an external voicemail integration with like another system. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that too much unless that's something you're specifically doing, like you're using a, a MyTel system, but you are trying to use an Avaya system for voicemail for some reason. Um, and then under that as well, you can also change the music on hold for um, a specific user group so that they're all different. So you could have like a billing and a support user group and you could have them set differently for the music on hold. So billing has a different music on hold from the support group if you wanted to do that. And then finally, down at the bottom here is your outgoing trunk groups. These are the, the trunk groups that this user group will be able to dial out using. Does not affect their ability to get inbound calls, but for outbound calls, they just need to have access to trunks that they can dial out from. In this case, because this is a demo system, I just have the three default groups in there. And you can see down at the bottom, there's an available pane, which is where my cursor is currently. And then also a selected pane. Um, you, you just want to highlight the ones that you need over, um, over and available for the users and move them into selected from available. And all you do for that is you highlight and then you click on one of the arrows. So to show you, I'm going to move digital loop start back. And so just to bring that back over, you see it's highlighted. I click the right arrow and it moves it over. That's all there is to it. So let's dive into those classes of service real quick so I can show you what you're looking for. And I'm going to start with telephony, which is the biggest class of service by far. So I clicked on that view class of service and you can see there are three at the top for telephony features permissions. There is fully featured, minimally featured and partially featured. And just like anything else, you can build your own or copy an existing and build off a template that way if you need to. Um, so you can create these on your own. Down inside the telephony class service, and I'm going to go ahead and expand this to make it easier to see. You have the ability to change things like the maximum call stack depth, which if you recall from Tuesday is the maximum number of calls that a user can take before their calls will just automatically go to voicemail and assume that the user is too busy. Um, it does default to eight. It can be set anywhere between one and 16. The maximum buddies per user is going to be the number of contacts they can put in their contact list in the connect client uh, defaults to 40. Um, you can set that anywhere between one and 500. We recommend sending it to 500 just because there's no reason not to. And then maximum private contacts are contacts that would be out um, uploaded using something like Outlook integration um, or creating custom contacts in the client itself. Um, that defaults to 500. You can set that to anywhere between 10 and 100,000. So you can have quite a few contacts if you need. Under that is your Make Me Conference maximum parties. Make Me Conference is if you place a call, then you conference somebody in using the conference button on the short telephone. Um, by default, this is going to allow up to three people on one call at the same time, meaning it's just you, um, the person you called first, and the person you brought in. This can actually be changed up to, up to eight um, with the ST switches. If you have the older SG switches, you can do a maximum of six. Um, and this does depend on the way that your switch is configured. So if this, isn't a fe if this is a feature that you're looking to implement in your system, I would recommend giving us a call so that we can take a look at your switch resources and make sure that you have enough switch resources available to do what you need to do. Um, under that, you'll see a whole bunch of checkboxes. I'm not going to go over all of these in great detail, but these govern things like being allowed to pick up calls to um, doing overhead paging reassigning your extension from one phone to another or, or essentially hot desking, um, showing extensions um, in the directory um, with different prefixes. So for example, users that start with eight would be able to see users that start with seven. If you uncheck that, they wouldn't be able to. Um, IP, IP phone button customization, which allows um, users to set up their own speed dial. Recording of your own calls, which is a feature on the client that you can do. Um, and then down at the bottom, you have your directed intercom, meaning you can intercom directly to somebody. Whisper paging, 
um, which is a one-way intercom, barge in, which is essentially going to place the person that you're barging in on on hold with their current call and immediately connect you with them. And then also recording others' calls, um, which is a function that you can do in here. These are more supervisor tools, as you can see. And also silent monitor and silent coach. Silent monitor lets you listen in on a conversation, but they can't hear you. Silent coach lets you listen in on a conversation and your rep can hear you, but the person that they're talking to can't. Um, so these are valuable supervisor tools. Um, and this has to be set up at the user group level to um, allow users to use these features. They are off by default. Um, so what is a common practice is to put the supervisors into a user group that will have these features turned on. And then you'll see also as well, it, in addition to allow initiation, which lets you start the process, the user group and users that you want to monitor or barge in on um, have to be able to accept that. So what you would do is you would turn on the accept button for the user group that needs to be able to be monitored. And then you would turn on the allow initiation on the user group for the users that need to be able to do it. Um, other options in here, um, you can show current availability state changes. Um, if you turn that, if you turn these off, the availability state and state detail changes, uh, users won't be able to change the state on their phone. So this lets them change it to like out of office or um, vacation, for example. And then also allow external call forwarding and find me destinations. Um, these, bo these boxes here will determine if the user group can have a cell phone uh, on file that they can actually set up for external assignments so that they can get calls there. Um, and we'll also um, allow them to um, have additional phones. So when their desk phone is called, for example, you can have their cell phone ring as well. You can turn this off completely if you want. And then under here where it says scope, this actually is redundant for the call permissions tab. So we'll skip that tab, but this is essentially exactly what that one does. Um, this will tell you where, where the user group is allowed to call. And you have the choice between local only, national long distance, national mobile, international long distance, and all calls. And then you can also restrict certain prefixes. So for example, um, here, if I wanted to restrict 900 calls, if I put plus one nine hundred in here, then anything that starts with one nine hundred will not be able to be called by this user group. Um, and then there's also a permissions function, which is a little bit more um, advanced. Um, so if you need something specific, I would reach out to us. That's going to contain more in it than we are going to be able to go through today. Just to show you, I'm going to click on call permissions here as well. Um, call permissions, as you can see here, it's got all the same features. The only difference is there's also an internal only for call permissions. This does supersede the option in um, the um, telephony class of service if they are different. Um, so anybody that's using the internal only call permission can only dial extension to extension. They can't dial any outside number. Otherwise, these functions are the same as the scope and the telephony features. And then finally, voicemail permissions. Um, and to go through this real quick, just like the other ones, you can create your own groups if you need. Um, the default ones that you will have is large mailbox, medium mailbox, no mailbox, and also small mailbox. And there are a number of different features that you can determine in here as well. So to pop this up here, um, your incoming message length is going to be how long a message can be that is left in a voicemail box on um, a user or work group that is using this voicemail box permissions. Um, the default is 480 seconds. Um, you can set this anywhere between zero and 3,600 seconds. Um, 3,600 seconds is an hour, and that also does govern the um, longest um, the longest time that you can record a call. So if you are recording calls, um, using the user group permissions, I would recommend setting this to the full, the full 3,600 so you can get up to an hour of recorded calls. Incoming max messages is how many um, messages your voicemail box can hold. Um, defaults to 60. Um, can be set anywhere between zero and 500. If you have the space, I would just set this to 500. And then outgoing message length is um, based on a feature you can use from the client where you can actually send a message directly to somebody's voicemail box without calling them. Um, the default for this is going to be 240 seconds. And just like the incoming message link, that can be anywhere between 0 and 3,600. Under that is enable voicemail callback. This is off by default. Um, it's important to note that 
Um, this does add an option in your voicemail to call somebody back directly, but it is off because that can be used um, by somebody to basically exploit calls. They can There we go, sorry about that. My microphone decided it wanted to stop working there. Um, you can change your lifespan of your voicemail password. Um, by default, it's gonna be off, um, but you can also um, set that between 30 and 365 days if you want to force people to change their voicemail passwords. Um, and then also you can set your um, days in advance for a password um, warning for expiration if you wanna let your users know that it's gonna expire. Um, you can allow access to the distribution list that we talked about yesterday if they want to get distribution uh, voicemails when people send those out. Um, message notifications, so you know that you got a voicemail, including message notification to an external number, which would be a phone call to let you know. Um, and also, you can actually turn on and off the ability to download voice messages as WAV files here. So if you have a policy or need to be um, held under a certain compliance so that you um, and as a result of that, you can't allow WAV files to be downloaded. You can actually just turn this off and not give users the option. Um, voicemail prompt mode, um, I would never touch this. I would just keep this at, at uh, Mitel. And then auto delete is kind of an auto pruning for um, voicemails. You can set it up to delete saved or unheard messages after um, a certain number of days, anywhere between a week and 2,000 days. Um, you can also delete anything heard um, anywhere between seven and two thousand days and then you can also de enable a auto delete notification so users know that they will have voicemails that will be deleted so they they can either go listen to them and save a little copy or jot down what they need um, as a part of that and so that's the class of services here um, the other piece that you can do in here and we we went over this yesterday is this availability states defaults um, this is going to look very similar to the availability states on the user. What all this does is you can preset these so that every user that is built after these are set will have the, the permissions that you need. So if you have like a whole bunch of users that you need to build that were um, needing to go directly to a group instead of to their own voicemail after, after um, their no answer destination had been reached, then you could change that here. Then once you create the users, that will be on their um, user profile and that will already be set for you. It does not affect users that are already built. This was only for users going forward. So that's important to note. And so that's class of service. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna jump into hunt groups. Um, the next three options are gonna be the majority of what you'll probably be doing in the system other than users. I'm gonna go through these and then um, we will open it up for questions, but um, I'm gonna start here with the hunt groups. As you can see, I've got a training hunt group at extension 119 here up at the top. Um, hunt groups, to give you an overview, these are a way to get group calls into your system. Um, this is one of two ways to do that. The other way in the system is work groups. Um, work groups and hunt groups are very similar with a couple key differences. Hunt groups do not have voicemail, but work groups do. Um, Hunt groups reside on a switch where work groups re reside on a server. Um, so if you have a local switch but not a local server for a site, then a hunt group might make more sense. Um, and work groups allow you to log in and out. Hunt groups do not, unless you're removed from the group um, in director itself. If you're a member of a hunt group, you are going to receive calls. So let me go ahead and take you through what a hunt group um, can do here. And this part will be fairly quick. So this is my the hunt group that I have set up for training blown up here. Um, and you'll see there is, I've got an extension. There's a backup extension, which I have set to extension 115. This is a mandatory field that will um, serve as the destination point for any calls that try to go to the hunt group and fail for whatever reason. It's like if, if you're trying to reach a um, hunt group where the switch has failed and the switch is not able to accept the request, then the system will say, okay, that is not there. We're going to go to this backup destination. That's what that's for. Underneath this is our, our DID settings, um, which is literally exactly the same as the um, 
DID settings on the user. So just to show you there, you can enable the DID. You've got your ranges here just like before, and you can manipulate the number just like before. If you have any questions on the DIDs, we did cover that on the Tuesday um, webinar as well. Um, and those will be available on our website, so you will be able to see those um, if you want to get some more information on that. Um, just like on the users as well, you can include them, these hunt groups, in the system dial by name directory. You can also make the extension private um, because hunt groups are not used for outbound calls. It, setting them as private will just remove them from the internal system directory. So it's a good way to make sure that your internal users don't call the extension. Um, then under that, this is where we start getting into more um, hunt group specific spots. So you have your distribution pattern. Um, this is gonna be how agents are reached. And you have two options in hunt groups. You have top down and you have simultaneous. Uh, top down is gonna go through the list of users that you create from spot one and work its way down the list. Simultaneous, as the name implies, is going to, dot, is going to ring every user in the group at the same time um, so that they um, are able to get the call. And then under that are your rings per member and also your no answer number of rings. Um, both of these can be set between one and 255 rings, which is quite a great deal of time. Uh, rings per member indicates how many rings each member will get before it moves on to the next member if there, there is a top-down environment. So in this particular case, at three rings per member, it would ring the first person in the group three times. If they don't answer the call, it will then stop ringing their phone and, and start ringing the second person up to three times. And it will keep going until it hits this no answer number of rings. So that's important to note because you wanna make sure everybody has the same amount of time to get the call. So if I had three members in this group and I wanted it to ring them three times, I would change my no answer number of rings to nine so each person could get three rings before it would go to the next destination. Um, if you're using simultaneous ring, the no answer number of rings is really all that matters because rings per member does not factor in. Call member when forwarding all calls is a checkbox that allows you to call any users that are externally assigned. If they are externally assigned by default with this box on check, they will not actually get the call. And then skip member if already on a call, pretty self-explanatory. If somebody in the hunt group is already on a call and a call comes into the hunt group, if this box is checked, it will, it will not ring them. Um, so by default, that is off. So they would get a call waiting beep indicating that there's a hunt group call. This is also another spot where hunt groups actually are different from work groups. Work groups will never present a second call to a user that's already on one and there's no way to configure that to happen. So if you need that to be a part of your call flow, then a hunt group makes more sense. Then you have your call forward destinations. Call stack full is if you hit that call stack depth and which is currently eight on this group. And then, so say a ninth call came in. Um, this is all for calls that are hanging out in the hunt group, not calls that are on users in the hunt group. So these would be actively ringing calls. Um, by default, if there's no destination set in the call stack full, um, the, the system will play a busy tone. Um, but you can set this to a user. So I will use 115, which is the same as the backup extension for that for now. There's also a no answer destination. So you can set, send it to a different destination after the, after the no answer number of rings has been hit. If you set nothing in here, if you leave it blank, calls will disconnect after two minutes. So they will continue to just keep ringing through, through users until two minutes is reached or it gets picked up. If it hits that two minutes, the call will just disconnect. So I'm going to put 115 in there as well, because obviously that is not something that we want. And then you also have an off hours and holiday destination. You can set a schedule um, to the hunt groups and work groups. Schedules is not going to be something we're going to be able to get to today. However, um, if you have any questions on that, you, you feel free to ask a question or shoot us an email. Essentially, you can set a time of day and, and dates and um, any holiday settings that you need to make sure that your phone system automatically knows your operating hours and then you can apply them to groups. And then under here, you can also even see the current availability state. So currently, because I have no schedule applied, um, the system knows that this hunt group is on hours. The next tab, which is the last piece of the hunt group is the, um, members, the, er, the members tab. And what this is, is just like anything else in the system, you've got your available and selected. So just like the trunk groups, 
Um, you can search for people using the magnifying glass. You can type in an extension or start typing a name, which is based on first name. Um, you can even drag these if you want to have name on the left and extension on the right. And all you got to do to add somebody to the group is you highlight them and you click on the arrow and you move them over. If I wanted to move multiple people at the same time, I can shift click and highlight them all and use the arrow and it will move them over as well. So you can do that too, here too. Um, and like I mentioned previously with a hunt group, if you're in the group, you're going to get the call. So um, as a part of that, um, you want to make sure that everybody that's in a hunt group is okay with taking a call. So this wouldn't be something that you would add a supervisor to that isn't supposed to take calls, but just governs over. That's going to be more of what a work group will be for, which is what we're about to get into here. Um, and then last but not least, just like on users, there's a DNS tab, so you can um, assign multiple numbers to the group at the same time. All right, and now I'm going to jump into work groups. Work groups are very similar, so I'm going to hit on the, dip, the uh, differences here. They're, they definitely are more powerful than a hunt group. Um, so there's, there's definitely reasons to use these over a hunt group in a lot of cases, uh, but it really depends on your environment, which works best for you. Um, so right here, you can see I've got my training work group at extension 120. And just like the hunt group, I've got a backup extension. I've, I have the ability to include in the system by all my name directory or make the extension private. And just like a hunt group, a work group does not make outbound calls. So you do, um, you would just uh, be removing this from the internal system directory if you make the extension private. You have your DID settings just like before. And then this is where it's a little bit different. Um, you do select a user group for a work group versus a hunt group. This is because of the voicemail options that we talked about in the class of service. Um, the class of service um, for each one of these um, user groups is gonna be what dictates the um, mailbox functionality for the work group. So you want to make sure that you have this set to the user group that you want. In this particular case, executives is totally fine. Uh, server uh, corresponds to the server that we're going to host the uh, voicemail, or I'm sorry, the uh, the work group on. Um, there's also a spot for the, for the voicemail. Um, and that is just the server that's going to facilitate the usage of the work group itself. So if you have two, two offices, one in Portland, one in San Jose, you've got servers at both and you've got a work group that is for the San Jose branch, you would just assign it to the San Jose server to have it local. Um, under that, you also have your enable mailbox. If you want a work group without a mailbox, you can uncheck this, that's totally fine. Um, and then the mailbox server is the exact same as the managing server, except it's just for the voicemail. So you would um, go ahead and just select San Jose for that as well, just so the local the local server would be hosting the voicemail as well as the work group services for the work group. Under that is work group name. This is just a recorded name for work group. Um, so if you don't want to have a personal customized greeting, you could literally just record um, and say training work group. And what what people would hear is you've reached the voice the Mitel voicemail box for training work group. Um, in that case, if you if you do have a customized greeting, which we're going to get into here momentarily, um, then that will supersede this. So if you're planning on having a custom greeting, this isn't a big one to worry about. And then a couple other quick quick options here: enable automatic agent logout on no ring, no answer. Um, does exactly what it sounds like. If an agent is considered available, um, call goes to that agent. That agent does not answer the call it will log the agent out so that no more calls are sent to them. We don't recommend this because a lot of people use work groups without the work group agent licensing, meaning the agent cannot log themselves back in. Um, so that's something to consider. And then also wrap up time is the number of seconds that an agent will get in between calls before they are sent another one. This is gonna to default to zero, zero seconds, meaning as soon as they're off call one, call two can present itself to them. If you set this to, set this to something like 20, then you would be able to um, ha let your agent have 20 seconds of breathing time to get any notes done or anything before another call can present. And then also you do have your current schedule available here. Uh, current schedule in work groups is based on routing. Um, and the routing here, um, as you can see, you can set a schedule if you want. Um, and that's going to dictate your 
if you're on hours or off hours, you'll see there are four new tabs there, on hours, off hours, holiday, and custom. They work essentially the same, so I'm just gonna go over on hours here to save us some time. But um, you have your distribution pattern, um, which is going to be um, top down, same as the hunt group. Round robin, which is gonna be, it starts at a different position each time, but um, agent one will get call one, agent two will get call two, so on and so forth. Uh, longest idle, whoever hasn't been on a phone call, and it's important to note this isn't just work group calls, this is any calls, um, would get the call first. And then simultaneous means everybody will get rang at the same time. Uh, call forwarding, because this is a voicemail based system with the work group, you can set this to always go to voicemail or to another source if you want, um, or set it to no answer slash busy, which is the normal use for this, which would be, you know, you send a call in, agents can't get to it, it rings six times, for example, and um, then at six times it would go to voicemail. You could do that. Or if you just need a voicemail box, you can set this to always. Um, under there, you can see all your different call forwarding options, just like on the users. So. Um, if you're busy, meaning the call stack depth has been reached, you can set it to somewhere else. You can set it set it to go to voicemail some, somewhere else for the no answer. And then if you check the always radio button, you can change the always destination as well. Um, the other option you'll see here is queuing. Um, there is limited queuing uh, um, setups that are available with the base system with work groups. Um, it's gonna give you a five step um, way to set up custom prompting and, and music so that um, people on hold can hear um, customized scripting. If you want more information on that, um, shoot us an email um, and we will get you squared away um, just to make sure that we, we can get you everything you need. There's a lot that can go into that more than we have time for on this call today. Um, and just like before on the hunt groups, um, we have a forward after, which is um, basically the no answer destination. Um, and also rings per agent. So just like before, um, that's gonna be how many how many times an agent gets rang before it will go to the next person if you're using something that's not simultaneous. Um, simultaneous works only off the, off the forward after box. So that's the only one you have to worry about if you're doing simultaneous ring. And then if all agents are logged out, it will it's automatically set to go to voicemail. You can queue this, I wouldn't recommend it because it's gonna queue to a spot where no agents are available to do anything. Um, but you do have that that option. And then under here, you will see work group greeting. Work group greeting is where you set the customized greeting. Um, and it is per call handling mode. So you want a different one for on hours versus off hours versus holiday versus custom. Um, and you can import a file here. It could be a WAV file or you can actually record from here as well if you um, have a microphone that can talk to the system. Um, on your PC, or you can use preferences, which is that button here, to call a specific extension, which would then allow you to record as well. So you do have all those options. Um, and just to show you here, those are all the same. So um, that is gonna be the same for all four modes there. So you would just wanna set whatever you needed to for off hours versus on hours. Um, an example, um, maybe during on hours, you have agents available to take calls. So you keep that at no answer slash busy for a whatever number of rings. Um, off hours, you might always go to voicemail, which is how it's already set up. So that is something to keep in mind there. The voicemail tab here is very, very simple. You can change the voicemail password on the work group if people are going to call into it using the voicemail login system. Um, the default password is 1234. This can be changed to whatever you want. Um, except broadcast messages does the exact same as the users. They'll get them the broadcast messages from the system distribution groups. Um, and then you can also, just like any, th any other user, you can have it set up to deliver any voicemails as a WAV file or a text message or a link. Um, and actually, in this case, it looks like it's just the WAV file or the text message. I thought they added the link to the work group. Apparently, that has not happened yet. Um, but um, this will allow you to send those emails to users. And so what you would do is you would just set up probably a distribution list for the members of the work group so that everybody can get it and then add that distribution list to the email address because only one email address can be in the box at any one time. 
Um, and then you also do have the automatic message forwarding here um, that we talked about on Tuesday. If you if you need those automatically sent somewhere, you can do it that way. You can also delete the message after forwarding um, to make sure that the work group doesn't show that it has on read messages. Um, also, one thing important to note is that users in the work group, if they have the Connect client, will be able to see that they have voicemails in the box um, on the client itself. So they can just check it that way. And if they do it that way, no voicemail passwords required. And then we also have the members tab, which, it, which you'll notice is exactly like the one on the Hunt group. There is one difference. So I'm gonna add all these users here. I'm gonna click on Tom and you'll see on the right here, this select agent state just popped up. By default, By default, this is going to be um, set to logged out. This means that users are not going to be receiving calls, but if they're in a work group that gets voicemails, they'll still be able to see the voicemails. So this is a good mode to have for work groups like that, that are voicemail only. Logged in means that the agent will be able to make and receive, or rather receive calls on the work group because work groups don't make calls. Um, and wrap up means that they're just in wrap up and waiting to um, finish up so that they can take another call. This is important on the back end because as I stated earlier, a lot of people use work groups without, need, without using the work group agent licenses for their users. The work group agent license allows your agents to log themselves in and out. Without that, you have to log them in either using a work group supervisor, which is another client access license, um, or you can log them in on director. So a good practice for this when you're setting up a work group is to select each user and log them in using the radio button here. And then finally, um, just like on the hunt group, you can use DNS mapping to DNS and other numbers. So if you have a work group with maybe a San Jose and a Portland number, to go back to my previous um, example, you would just, you would DID, use the DID field to assign one and you'd use the DNS mapping field to assign the other. And that's all there is to it. And then just to show you very briefly the queue handling I was talking about, um, this is why we we don't have enough time to go over this today. Um, but this is essentially a miniature auto attendant. You can select up to five steps. Um, you can set up a warning for, how, for calls queuing up. By default, it'd be three. Um, as well as a waiting time warning, which defaults to 60 seconds, any calls over 60 seconds will make a warning go off. Agents, allow agents to pick up from queue, allows them to um, pick up and essentially cherry pick calls. And then down at the bottom, you'll see your five steps here. Um, for each one of these steps, you can select a certain amount of time until the next step. You can, you can select a new prompt um, for people to listen to, so, you know, Something like, um, sorry, sorry, everybody's busy. Um, we're gonna get to you as quickly as possible, something like that. And then you can also include very limited um, options for them to press. So you could have like, press one takes a message and goes to the work group, for example. So you could do stuff like that. And you can do up to five steps or you could only do one step if you want. You could use the, step, the skip the step box and only use step five and just have like one message that plays, you can do that too. Um, if you have any questions on that, just let us know and we'll be able to help you out with that. All right, and finally, we're gonna get into auto attendance here. Um, and after this, I'm gonna go very briefly over diagnostics and monitoring as well, so you can see that piece. Um, but for the auto attendant, um, this is what a lot of people refer to as a call tree. Um, this will allow you to set up a list of numbered options that people can use to call into the system. Um, and so to blow this up here, this is my training auto attendant. You'll see it's at extension 700. Um, there is no backup destination or anything for this. It, um, it just goes directly to the auto attendant in this case. And this does work off the server. Um, you can select a DID just like anything else in the system. And then down here, this maximum time to enter multiple digits, this is how long the system listens for multiple digit presses after you press the first option. So if I were to press one, 
the system is going to wait um, by default 3,000 milliseconds um, for me to press another digit. And if it doesn't, it's going to try to go to option one. This is to make sure that you can dial extensions if you have multiple digit dialing turned on on the auto attendant. This can be set anywhere between 1,000 and 7,000 milliseconds. I have found um, personally that the default is plenty of time. Under that, you have the ability to make the extension private, which just like uh, the Hunt Group and Work Group does not affect anything outbound, just removes it from the internal system directory so people don't call it directly. And then also allow prompt recording using telephone. This is gonna be a big one for a few, a few uh, of the people that might be watching here, specifically if you have something like a inclement weather auto attendant that you need to change the greeting on. This is gonna be the easiest way to do it. What you would do is you would turn on the allow prompt recording using telephone. You can change the menu password to whatever you want it to be. The default will be one, two, three, four. And then um, you can use the voicemail login system, then dial in the auto attendant extension and the password. And you can change the greeting on the fly. So if you got 18 feet of snow one day and you can't make it to the office, um, you could use this feature assuming of course, that you haven't lost power because 18 feet of snow would be crazy. Um, but you do have that ability. Um, you do have the DNS tab, just like anywhere else, to add multiple numbers. And then these four, just like on the work group, on hours, off hours, holiday, and custom, they work the same. It's just dependent on the schedule type that is currently applied to the auto attendant and what, what schedule it falls under for that specific time. Um, so to go through that here, you can change your schedule up here. Um, you can disable your monitor or record warning tone. The system does a little beep if the call is being recorded by default. Um, you can actually turn this off if you wish here. That is regulated by state laws and federal laws. So it does depend on where you're located, whether or not you can actually do that, I believe. Um, the timeout is how long somebody has to enter a menu option before it will go to the timeout destination, which is something you can configure. Um, the default of 8,000 milliseconds gives them a decent amount of time to press an option. Um, you, can, you can change this anywhere from zero, meaning as soon as they hear the greeting, as soon as the greeting finishes, it's gonna go. Um, or 30,000 milliseconds, which I haven't even tested, but I would imagine that is going to be in amazing amount of time um, to, make a, to make a change. Prompt tests is just an informational field. And you can put in whatever prompting you wanna have for the auto tenant here. It doesn't actually apply it to the auto tenant, but it will give users an idea of what the auto tenant does. So it's a nice field to have. And then right under that is the recorded prompt, which is just like the work greetings. You can import a file, you can record it, if you wanna use a phone instead of a microphone attached to the PC that you're working on, you can hit preferences and you can type in an extension or an external number to call um, that will allow you to record the phone, the uh, greeting. And then under here are all the options. So zero through nine, as well as pound and star are used on the auto tenant um, and can be used for specific options. Um, and to show you the options here, you can do a dial by first name or last name, which actually gives access to the dial by name directory. They can then use their keys to start dialing in a name. Um, and it will come up with the recorded greetings of the users that are in the system. Um, so that's important because your users do have to record their name as part of their setup for their voicemail. And um, if they haven't, for example, on my extension, Tom Lyons, I haven't on my demo system, if somebody, um, hit dial by first name and then hit T, I would still come up, but it would say extension 115 instead of my name. So it's important to make sure your users actually set up their mailbox and record their name. Um, same goes for last name, it works the exact same way. Go to extension is going to be a user in the system, so or a group as well. So any hunt group, work group, or user extension, or route point, which is another another more advanced piece that we're not going to cover as a part of this admin training um, that would be used under the go to extension. You'll note there's also a transfer to extension at the bottom here. The only difference between go to extension and transfer to extension is that the system will say, please wait while I transfer your call when you use transfer to extension. Because of that reason, almost everybody uses go to extension. 
Um, go to menu is going to be another auto attendant menu in the system. So you can set it to another auto attendant menu. This is nice if you have an overall, like an admin menu that then has sub branches that have that need to have options. You would have kind of like a two tiered auto attendant menu system in that case, where this button would go to the next menu with which would then give you the next available options. Hang up. Pretty sure you guys know what that means. Um, hangs up the call. Log into voicemail will give you the ability to actually um, press that button to log into the voicemail system and enter your extension and password so that you can check your own voicemails. Or you can do it to, to change those work groups um, or auto attendant greetings. So this is a good way to do that. A lot of people use star or pound for that. Repeat prompt will repeat the greeting. Take a message works just like go to extension, except instead of ringing the phone, it goes straight to voicemail. So this is great for after hours. And then you can also do a take a message by first or last name so that will give them access to the dial by name directory. But instead of ringing their phone when they get selected, it will just go straight to that person's voicemail. So all of those options are available on the auto tenant and you just need to you just need to pick the options that work for you. So for example, if I wanted to set it up so that it was like, thank you for calling the training auto tenant. Um, to dial by first name, press one. To go to talk to Tom Lyons, press two. To hear these messages, to hear this message again, press three. And then maybe um, if you if you know your party's extension, you may dial at any time. That's going to be down at the bottom here. Um, and you'll notice there's there's options for timeout, too many errors, invalid entry, and multiple digits. Timeout is if they hit that timeout um, number and no buttons have been pressed. This is also important because if there's an issue with your trunks or with the other users' trunks that they're calling you in, calling into you from, um, the button press known as DTMF might not actually get to the system. And this will allow the call to still go somewhere if that functionality is not working for some reason, which is fairly common. Um, too many errors means that for example, on this auto tenant, we have options one through three available. Somebody pressed five three different times. Um, the, the first couple times, it's going to use the invalid entry, which is going to default to repeat the prompt. And then under too many errors is once they hit it that third time and it's still wrong, you have options there as well. Um, by default, the system is going to repeat the prompt. Um, if you choose an option that's not valid, um, and then it will hang up on the third attempt. It'll just say goodbye, and it will hang up on you. Um, you can set this to go to an extension or to another menu if you want. Um, so that way you can send confused callers to like an auto attendant menu or to an operator group that will be able to get them to where they need to go. And just to show you here, each one of these options is the same. So this would be for on hours operation. You can do the same thing for off hours operation. If you have a holiday schedule applied, you can do the same here. And if you ever have a custom schedule applied, you can also set that one up differently as well. And just like the work group, every one of these has unique prompting. So if you want to have a different off hours greeting as opposed to on hours, that would say, you know, thanks for calling the trading auto tenant. We are currently closed. You can do that and um, import those here. Otherwise, you would want to import the same greeting into each one of these to make sure that all of them have a greeting. Otherwise, you're going to get the default uh, voice when you call in um, on that on a holiday or off hours time. All right. And so that is work groups, hunt groups, and auto attendants. We've got a few more minutes here. Um, just so you guys know, I'm planning to do the same thing that we did on Tuesday. I'm going to stay a few minutes past the hour to make sure that I can answer your questions. But I'm going to show you diagnostics and monitoring real fast, just so you can see what you're looking for. Um, so as we um, mentioned on Tuesday at the beginning of the call, there are six different buttons up at the top here that kind of govern what you can see in Director. You have administration, system, reporting, documentation, maintenance, and diagnostics. What we want to go to is maintenance, which is the little graph. And it's going to bring you to this page here. And I'm going to click on dashboard. You're not going to see a whole lot because this system isn't actually used for making or taking calls. This is my sandbox and my virtual environment. Um, so I like to break things in here. But um, 
this will show you something like your, your call volume total for the system. So how many calls you're taking um, on an hour basis. Um, you can see your call quality, which you always want to stay above that red line. Your bandwidth utilization, which is going to be based on the, um, the bandwidth allocation that's on the sites tab. Um, if you have any questions on that, just let us know. Um, your trunk usage, feature usage, and CPU usage of your switches. Um, the other page that you'll often use is connectivity. If you're used to 14.2, this is going to look a lot like Quick Look. And don't worry, this is by design right now. I only have my server on at the moment. But um, you'll see here, um, this looks a lot like Quick Look. And what this is, is you'll see these are all numbered options. So I've got options one through five. And then across on the top is what that switch is talking to. Um, and so you can see here that um, the headquarters switch is up, but the other switches are yellow, which is an unknown status. That's just because they're not powered on. So that's by default. What you want to see here is green across the board. If you have this um, speckled between green and red, that means certain devices cannot talk to one another. And that can um, cause a lot of problems in the MITEL or really any PBX system if endpoints cannot talk to one another. So this is important to note if you are having issues and you see um, like a red non-connected box um, or a whole bunch of them on this on the screen, you want to give us a call so that we can take a look for you. And then the last piece in here um, that's important is status and maintenance. I'm going to show you the system tab, but this gets very granular. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to break out each one of your sites show what is working, your, your communication for all your switches. Um, and then also um, it'll show you um, all of your servers and appliances on the right side. So this looks a lot like the overall quick look tab in 14. Um, and as you can see here, I've got one of five communications at my headquarters site. If I click on this, it's gonna bring me to the headquarters site. Um, and that's gonna actually list out all the switches at that location as well as the servers. Um, and then it, and uh, this will show you basically everything in the system for that particular site. Um, appliances is going to show you your servers and your switches. This isn't going to be based by site. This is going to just be all of them in the system. And you can see things at a glance, like their IP, their MAC addresses, um, their comms. So that's what they're talking to um, and what they're supporting and what they're capable of supporting. So you have all those. And then you can also do it with servers which is going to be very similar to the other ones. The difference here is you can actually see that the services are running on the server here. Um, so this is nice to see. So let's say you've got a remote site and voicemail is not working. You can go into diagnostics and monitoring, click on servers, find the server at that site and say, oh, the voicemail service on that box is not running. And if that's the case, without even having to log into the box directly, you can actually click on the service itself and hit this and you can either start or stop them. So you can actually start the services remotely using the, using the uh, system so that you don't have to log into the box, go into the, uh, the services container in windows and start them that way. So you do have that capability. And then you can also see the same, the similar things for IP phones. I don't have any IP phones in the system, but it would show the, the model, the IP address, if they're talking their firmware status and if they're up to date. Um, you can see the trunk groups. Um, so you can see all of your trunk group information here um, and also voicemail, which in this case is just my one voicemail server. And you can see I've got five voicemail boxes. I should probably clean up some space on my hard drive. Um, but uh, you can see what is available there as well. And with that, we are just about out of time for the training piece. Um, I hope what I went through was informative. I know I went through fairly quickly. Um, but as I noted, I am going to stay on for a few minutes here and try to answer as many questions as I can. And then we will be sending out an email um, to everybody that attended with the answers to the questions that get asked. So with that in mind, uh, Mr. Sheehan, do we have any questions that are available to answer? We do. Okay. Um, the, first, the first is... <clears throat> How does the max call stack depth here compare to the stack depth within each extension? So, and I'm assuming, 
I'm assuming they just mean group wise because all the groups mm -hmm. have a call stack def. What they do is those apply to the groups themselves. Um, the groups themselves um, do not care about the user call stack def because they're coming through the group. But when it when it talks about the call stack def there for a hunk group, that just means you can have up to eight calls ringing at the same time. Um, once a call is picked up from a hunk group, it is no longer considered to be part of that call stack def for that hunk group. Um, so it does work a little bit differently there. Um, I've, I don't think I've ever seen any hunk group exceed eight, even in the busiest of systems because of that. Okay. Can users hot desk if they don't have voicemail? The short answer to that is no. Um, the voicemail system is used for hot desking. Okay. If a call is being recorded and it goes over an hour, will it all be recorded just within a different name? For example, call one, call two, ETC? Unfortunately, no, and that would be the most ideal scenario. Unfortunately, I think it wasn't packaged that way because they all, they being Mito, also offer a call recording third party up, or not third party, but advanced application um, that they charge for. So what the way it works is when you start manual call recording, um, there will be a faint beep that you'll hear every few seconds. That's to let people know that the call is being recorded. At the end of however long um, you have the, app, the incoming message length set on the user group, which like I mentioned, I would recommend setting in 3,600 seconds to give you that full hour. That recording is going to end and it's going to then deposit itself into the voicemail box of the user. At that point, they would want to restart the recording process again to start a new file. It will not automatically roll over. Okay. There's a couple questions regarding uh, follow-up regarding uh, queue handling for uh, work groups. One, another question is, is there a way to give users an option to unlock their account in Active Directory when calling an auto attendant or work group? No, there is no way to do that. Okay. How is Nuisance Call Handler addressed in Connect? Um, it's a great question because I haven't actually directly used the Nuisance Call Handler. However, my understanding is it, it has not changed from 14 and it has the same functionality. Okay. One it also wants additional um, information on uh, workgroup queues, but also asks, is there any reference guides or manuals for Connect Director? I don't, well, there is the administration guide, which is going to be very, very similar to the guide that you have in 14.2. We can provide that for you. If you're looking for something more hands-on, um, a couple options, one being these recordings, which will be available on the inflowcommunications.com website. So you can, you can watch and grab these again. If you're looking for something that's more customized, um, your best bet may be to go through the training that Mitel offers. These aren't free, but they do have self-paced as well as instructor-led training that will cover each of the aspects and allow you to um, get acquainted with the system in that regard. So that might be a good option for you. If that's an option that sounds good for you, I would reach out to your account executive and see what they can do for you. Has the trunk tester been updated? It takes too long to start. Um, it is still the same um, Visual Basic scripting tool that was used before. I will say that in my experience with Connect, it does run a little bit faster than it did with 14, um, but it really hasn't been updated. It's got it's got the same look, same functionality. It works exactly the same. So I don't think they, they did anything with the code. Okay. Um, next question is, should short tail hardware updates always be pushed out right away? Um, if we're talking about the firmware updates to the switches and for the for any DVS servers when you upgrade your system, um, then the answer is yes, simply because every facet of the short tail infrastructure has to be on the same firmware in order for them to communicate. Otherwise, parts of your phone system just won't work. If you're talking about updating as soon as an update comes out, um, I would exercise caution with that, just like with any other big program. Um, Chortel is not immune to bugs. Um, I'm sure there's a few people nodding and laughing as I said that in the background. Um, but uh, they're not immune to bugs. Um, we recommend waiting at least a few weeks so that we can vet a particular build before we upgrade to it. Um, that way we can minimize any pain points that could come up. 
and then the 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 old adage that I adhere to really is if it isn't broken, don't fix it. If you're not having any problems, if you don't need to do something like update your your servers to the absolute latest Windows updates, if that none of those are an issue for you, I would recommend not updating. Okay. And then the next question is, can you log in as a regular user into the web-based communicator app, as in do a demo of it on the webinar? So the web-based communicator, um, as of yet, is not supported in Connect. So unfortunately, I cannot. OK. And like I mentioned, uh, there were just some questions if we can send additional queue handling um, information, uh, which we can. Um, those are all the questions as of right now, unless any others come in. Sure, let's wait and give them a couple minutes here because I think we've done pretty well in time. Yeah, it's only five after, so give people a few more minutes. Um, to address the queue handling, because um, it sounds like a few of those have come up, um, that's, that's gonna be more like an extra probably 20, 25 minute um, talk in terms of what those can do. Um, so we'll see what we can do internally here to get some sort of resource out for that. Okay, and I'll just keep looking for the next few minutes if any questions come in. Sure. Uh, hi, is Brightmetrics still support in Connect? Yes, we use it all the time. I love Brightmetrics. It is definitely supported in Connect. You are good to go there. Sweet. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions coming in? Oh, will there be additional training for admins, more specific topics like auto attendance? Um, so we do have an auto attendant training that is up on the Info Communications website. So I'd recommend checking that out. We did a series about six months ago where um, these topics were actually broken out quite a, quite a bit more. Um, and those may interest you. So those should all be up on our Inflow um, Communications website if you want to take a look at those. Just waiting for other questions to pop in. Sure, and to elaborate on that one, if you, if you do watch those and you still have questions, best thing to do is to contact our support desk, support at inflowcommunications.com. Um, if you need any specific info, we can get it for you. Um, everybody you're going to talk to ha is well experienced with the uh, with the director platform, and we'll be able to get you what you need. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, missed part one of two of these trainings. Any chance you have, will have a recording made available for these trainings? Yes, and they will be available on our website. Um, it does take a few days for us to process and upload those, um, but I would probably look for those, I don't know, maybe mid next week. They should be available. All right, and I think at this point we are good. So if you have any more questions, feel free to shoot them over to us in an email. Um, let us know, we will make sure that we get those taken care of for you. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you for joining our two-part training. My name is Tom with Info Communications and um, from me and Chris, thank you all and have a wonderful day.